Michael Britton, Dr. Michael Britton of Denver, Colorado, was born in Johannesburg. He's both a musician and an engineer. In South Africa, he performed as a solo violinist in chamber groups and as a soloist with the Johannesburg and SABC Symphony Orchestra under Edgar Cree. He graduated from WITS in chemical engineering. His master's and PhD degrees were from Yale in Connecticut, where he was a member of the Yale Symphony and Waterbury Symphony Orchestras. He has written for Encyclopedia Britannica, violinist.com, American Scientist, and numerous other publications. Aside from his book on Hefetz, South Africa features in his previous book, Discover Namibia. He lives in Colorado with his wife, Elizabeth, and family, where he's president of his own engineering consulting company. Okay, so we're going to go over to Mike now, and at the end of his talk, which will be about 45 minutes, you're all welcome to ask questions. Enjoy the evening. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Geraldine. And my thanks, too, to the South African Jewish Museum for hosting this presentation. I have to say I feel humbled to be presenting in such august company and to be kicking off the series. Thank you, Geraldine, for inviting me to be part of it. At this time, I would like to add my thoughts and those of our Denver community here to Israel as she defends herself and in fact defends all of us and indeed defends civilization of which music is such an integral part. Now in this presentation, I will first be giving you some brief background to Yasha Heifetz. I will tell you how his South African tour came about and then get into the tour itself. So to start, uh, Heifetz was born in Vilna in 1901. He was called Yashinka from a very early age, hence Yasha, and he died in Los Angeles in 1987. In his long career, other notable violinists such as Henrik Schering and Itzhak Perlman would refer to Heifetz as the king of violinists. The young Perlman, in fact, when speaking to Heifetz one day, said he felt as if he was talking to God. And that eventually morphed into the name of a documentary movie on the life of Heifetz called God's Fiddler, which you can find online. Here is what other string players had to say about Heifetz. Yo-Yo Ma, I think he's the greatest string player that has ever lived without question. Then David Oystruck, there are many great violinists, then there's Heifetz. And lastly, there is, is the Scottish violist William Primrose who said he was unique. There's never been a violinist like him and never will be. He could produce a beauty of phrase that was heartbreaking. On the right is a photograph of David Oystruck. I took at a concert in New York in 1965. Here is a picture of the Heifetz family taken in Vilna. And you see uh, Yasha on the left, his mother standing at the back and his father sitting on the right-hand side. Yasha was brought up in a typical Jewish household of the time. He attended Cheda and his grandfather, Ilya Heifetz, gave Torah lessons. As a child going to shul, he would have heard the sounds of Chazanut, and a case has been made by one biographer that such early Jewish influences became infused into his unique style of playing and musical expression. He started learning the violin with his violinist father, Reuben, at age three, then went to the Vilna Music School when he was five, made his debut in Kovno at age seven, playing the Mendelssohn Concerto, and eventually at age nine was admitted to study with the legendary pedagogue Leopold Auer at the famed St. Petersburg Conservatory. Now, getting to St. Petersburg took some doing. The conservatory had a quota on Jews, and in addition, since Vilna was in the Pale of Settlement, in reality a form of Russian apartheid, permits were required for Jews to leave the Pale as well as to live in St. Petersburg. Leopold Auer pronounced Heifetz as the greatest genius to pass through his hands. So at this point it is worth pausing for a moment to consider what is genius in the world of music. 
it's very difficult to describe in words, but perhaps the best I can do is to give you a definition by German philosopher Arthur Schopenhauer. And this is what Schopenhauer said. Talent is like the marksman who hits a target that others cannot reach. Genius is like the marksman who hits a target that others cannot even see. Here in the photo on the left, we see Heifetz in 1913. And the year before, when he was just 11 years old, he broke into the exclusive Berlin musical scene when he played before an audience of big name music critics and violinists. As he finished playing on that occasion, Fritz Kreisler got up and pronounced to the stunned gathering, gentlemen, now we can all break our violins across our knees. On the right, 20 years later, on January the 4th, 1933, you see Heifetz appearing with the Berlin Philharmonic just a few months after his tour of South Africa. And famed German Jewish photographer Alfred Eisenstadt had organized a front row seat and snapped this photograph with his signature Leica camera. The fame of this astonishing young talent quickly spread across the Atlantic. And so the Heifetz family left Russia in September 1917 for a tour of the United States barely managing to escape the Bolshevik revolution. Yasha's playing was their ticket out of the ghetto and onto America. Here on the right, we have the 16 year old Yasha at the time he made his sensational American debut at Carnegie Hall in October, 1917. On the left is page one of the program. And you will notice that he was billed as the new Russian violinist, not the new Jewish violinist. Being Jewish was not a way to advance a career, certainly in those days. You may also be able to see that the first item on the program was the Chacon composed by the early 1700s Italian composer Tommaso Vitali, but played here with organ accompaniment for dramatic effect. One can get some idea of the shock and awe of this debut by going to YouTube and listening to the 1957 recording of Heifetz playing the Chacon with Richard L. Sasser at the organ. Then you will truly understand the meaning of God's Fiddler. Anyway, with this landmark concert, the standards of violin mastery were raised forever. And on this particular occasion, another great violinist, Misha Elman, was seated in the auditorium with pianist Leopold Godofsky. The throng spelled down by the playing of young Heifetz, Elman, mopping his brow, turned to Godofsky and remarked how hot it was in the hall. Not for pianists, came Godofsky's immortal reply. There were others, of course, who were able to use music as the vehicle to enable their flight to freedom from the pale. Among them, for purposes of our story, were the Achron brothers, Joseph and Isidore. Both had studied at the St. Petersburg Conservatory along with Heifetz, and both made it to the United States in the 1920s. In 1922, not long before the middle photograph was taken, pianist Isidore signed a contract to be Yasha's official accompanist on a tour to the Far East. The contract was to be for a year. The relationship lasted not one year, but 10, including the 1932 tour of South Africa. Yet someone else who understood the concept that musical proficiency could gain them their freedom from the ghetto was Abraham Chernievsky, seen here on the right of this family picture taken in 1898. He and his wife Rosa had nine children, seven of whom are shown in the picture. All were required to play an instrument and all had to play in Abraham's orchestra. The four youngest from left to right are Alex, who played the piano, Michelle the cello, Jan the piano, and Leo the violin. The latter three, that is Michelle, Jan, and Leo, formed the Chernievsky trio and became international celebrities. Here on the left is Abraham Chernievsky's orchestra, and on the right, the young Chernievsky trio, whose good looks, long hair, and warm personalities contributed to their public appeal. They were the Beatles of their time. 
The trio toured the world, including South Africa in 1908, and in due course, Alex and Leo settled in South Africa. Leo became a leading violinist in the South African musical scene. Alex became a top impresario in South Africa, the Sol Hurok of South Africa, as it were, and he brought out many great artists to South Africa in the 1920s and 30s, including Anna Pavlova, as you see on the left, in 1925, Ignaz Friedman, the Polish pianist in 1930, and Benna Mazevich, who came to South Africa in 1931. Later in the 1930s came Arthur Rubinstein, seen here with Heifetz and cellist Pierre Gorski when they collaborated as the Million Dollar Trio. My parents met Rubinstein in Johannesburg, and he signed for them his recording of the Tchaikovsky Concerto. On the right, a photograph I took of Rubinstein 27 years later. In this portrait, he was just two weeks shy of his 78th birthday. At this point, there is a further personality I need to introduce for the story, one Isidore Schlesinger. Schlesinger was born in New York City in 1871 to Hungarian Jewish immigrants. And he was attracted by headlines of diamond and gold and he sailed for South Africa in 1894 to seek his fortune, which he duly did. In 1913, Schlesinger bought the Insolvent Empire Theater in Johannesburg. Then linking with one Harry Stodel, who owned some cinemas and theaters and a film distribution business in Cape Town, the foundation for the flourishing African Consolidated Theaters conglomerate was created. By the time of the Heifetz tour in 1932, Chernievsky had linked with African Consolidated Theaters, as it evident from the program on the right. This particular program, which as you can see is autographed, was kindly given to me by Dr. Roger Stewart. His parents had attended a Heifetz concert in Durban and went backstage to get the program signed. Here we have African Consolidated Theaters Plaza Cinema in Johannesburg. It was completed in 1931, just in time to serve as a venue for Heifetz concerts. At the time, it was billed as the most modern theater in South Africa. In the late 1940s and early 50s, I used to take a tram downtown Johannesburg with friends on a Saturday afternoon to see the adventures of Superman at the Plaza Bioscope, as we called it in those days. It was always difficult for me to conceptualize what the Superman of the fiddle had once performed there. Anyway, having concert venues was just one piece of the Heifetz tour puzzle. The tour was indeed an extraordinary cultural event in the history of South Africa, but underlying it all, it was still a financial enterprise for Alex Chernievsky. So we need to spend a moment examining the business end of things. How in fact did Chernievsky manage to get Yasha Heifetz, the world's most sought after and highly paid artist, to come all the way to South Africa in the depths of the Great Depression? Right in the middle of the South African tour, the Dow Jones Industrial Index on the New York Stock Exchange hit its lowest point, having dropped by 89% from its high of September the 3rd, 1929. Tenievsky had to account for paying Heifetz and his accompanist, not only for the seven and a half weeks and 20 concerts of the tour itself, but also for the three weeks they would be on the high seas sailing between Southampton and Cape Town. Unlike many of the Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe who had preceded them on the southbound Newcastle line, Heifetz and Achron would not exactly be traveling in steerage. So the challenge was huge and the risks were high. And having posed this question, here are four factors which uh, entered into Chernievsky's financial calculus. In the first case, because of her gold production, South Africa had not devalued her currency unlike Great Britain, Canada, and Australia. So when it came to paying high fits in US dollars, the South African pound was quite a strong currency and it would take less pounds to, to uh, satisfy high fits fee. Secondly, teaming up with African consolidated theaters helped uh, Chernievsky to finance the venture and to spread the risk. 
Thirdly, given all the artists he had brought to, to South Africa, Chernievsky was highly experienced and well-connected. And finally, Chernievsky was relying on the loyalty of his South African audiences, particularly its Jewish faithful, hungry for live classical music. So back to our story. In the 1920s, with his fame established, Heifetz would rub shoulders with many celebrities. Here he is on the left with Charlie Chaplin, and on the right we see the adventurous Rang Heifetz indulging his passion for flying in the early days of aviation. On the left of the picture is the pilot of the biplane, on the right Heifetz, and in the middle, the star of silent films Dagmar Godofsky, who happens also to be the daughter of Leopold Godofsky, whom we met earlier at Carnegie Hall. On the left here, in this picture, we see Heifetz and Achron with another actress of the silent movies, Barbara Kent. And on the right, in due course, Heifetz would in fact marry a film star, the lovely Florence Vider. And here you see the wedding announcement in the New York Herald Tribune. The 1920s also saw the adventurous Heifetz setting out on several tours of Europe, the Middle East, the Far East, and even Aust Australasia. Here, for example, in 1926, we see him in Budapest, Hungary, and on the right-hand side at the Kibbutz of Ein Harod. The Ein Harod concert made a huge impression on Heifetz. As you can see, he appears on a makeshift stage with an upright piano, which had to be hauled many miles to the site and then raised onto the platform. Thousands of Chalutzim came from their work in the fields to hear him. And so we come to the culmination of all his world travels, the epic world tour of 1931-32, in which Heifetz actually circumnavigated the globe. He decided to take Florence along, and here on the right, the couple arrives in Japan in September 1931. This mammoth undertaking lasted 11 months, went to 22 countries, and Heifetz gave 100 concerts. South Africa was the last and longest leg of the tour, so let's fast forward to May the 21st, 1932, when the party boarded the Winchester Castle in Southampton for the voyage to South Africa. In the photograph on the right, in between Heifetz and Achron, you can see Leo Chernievsky, Alex's brother, whom we saw earlier as a child member of the Chernievsky trio. He tagged along with Heifetz and Achron through the whole tour, to ensure that things ran smoothly. As you might also observe from this picture on board, Florence is nowhere to be seen. So where was she? Well, when the tour reached Egypt, Florence abruptly returned to the United States, but with no reasons offered by the couple. She never got to South Africa. One can only imagine the buzz in the social columns of the South African press had Heifetz been accompanied by his glamorous American film star wife in South Africa. But unfortunately, both press and public were denied the added excitement. Now, the South African public, of course, knew Heifetz through his 78 RPM recordings. Heifetz himself was a keen record collector, as we can see from the picture on the left. But records can go only so far. As Nathan Milstein once remarked to Itzhak Perlman, forget the recordings. And below, uh, he said, forget the recordings. You haven't heard Heifetz if you didn't hear him live. The recordings didn't even do him justice. And then below that, we have uh, an, uh, a piece from the Natal Witness after a concert in Peters Maritzburg on June the 29th, 1932. The most perfect of his recordings have not caught to the full his perfect artistry. On the right, a picture of Nathan Milstein playing the Beethoven Concerto with the New Haven Symphony in 1966. To snap this photograph, I had to take a leaf out of Alfred Eisenstadt's book by engineering a seat in the front row of the concert hall. Now, the Winchester Castle docked in Cape Town on May the 30th, 1932. As many of you know, arrival in Cape Town could be spectacular. But the weather on this occasion was not cooperative. 
Table Mountain was shrouded in mist and the tablecloth. Heifetz may not have been aware of the immortal words of Francis Drake that this was the fairest cape in all the circumference of the earth. But as he slipped through the dockside puzzles on his way to the waiting car, he was heard to utter the perhaps less memorable words, so this is Cape Town. The same afternoon, Heifetz and Achron were taken to the home of African Consolidated Theatre's executive, Mr. and Mrs. S. M. Whale, for a welcome reception. And the reception was followed by tea and dancing in the dining room. The social pages of the Cape Papers reported that Heifetz charmed everyone and that he was one of the keenest dancers and looked as if he was thoroughly enjoying his first entertainment in Africa. The next day, Heifetz was interviewed by the Cape Argus. The respondent reported as follows. I lunched with Yasha Heifetz at the Queen's Hotel and found him a charming young man. He is simple and unassuming. And during this interview, Heifetz even took the opportunity to perform some conjuring tricks for the reporter. In this slide, we see the first concert in Cape Town City Hall. And on the right, an ad from the Afrikaans paper Die Burger, which promotes the concert as a musical event without equal, first concert by Heifetz. And then down below it says, last concert, last concert, Friday the 3rd of June. So what's going on here? Only two concerts in Cape Town after coming all this way. How astute of Cherniavsky to suggest that there would be only two opportunities to hear the great Yasha Heifetz. The city hall was full to overflowing. People were turned away on both occasions. Notwithstanding this canny marketing ploy, at this point, Cherniavsky had already planned a third and even a fourth concert. Here on the left, we see the repertoire of the first two concerts and the front page of the program. You'll notice, if you can read it, that the first item on the debut concert program is in fact the Vitali Shakon, exactly as it been the case at Carnegie Hall 15 years earlier. Cape Times the following day, the concert under the headlines, Heifetz in City Hall, brilliant, organize, brilliant inauguration of Union Tour, master musician and virtuoso. And the music critic of the paper, one Minna Barrow Dowling, wrote as follows. At his first recital in the City Hall last evening, Heifetz, playing superbly, secured a great personal triumph and was given an overwhelming reception by an immense audience. Among those present were their excellencies, the Governor General and Countess of Clarendon, Sir Herbert and Lady Standy, and many prominent musicians of the peninsula. Heifetz is alike a master technician and a master musician. He is, in other words, a highly intellectual artist whose gifts as a virtuoso are never exploited at the expense of the composers whose music he so beautifully and artistically interprets. This is the program of the fourth concert in Cape Town, folded out so that you can see the front page on the right and the rear page with the advertisement on the left. Heifetz kept all his concert programs, and you can see on this one, he has written in pencil on the top, Cape Town, fourth concert, and in brackets, last. So it was anticipated that this would be the last concert in Cape Town. Here are the um, two inside pages of that program showing the program notes. And this concert was unique in that it was the only orchestral concert of the tour. The first half was devoted to the Rosamunde Overture and the Beethoven Concerto with the Cape Town Municipal Orchestra conducted by William Pickerel. Then at intermission, the stage was cleared and the second half was a recital with Achron at the piano. You might be able to make out that the very first item on the program, in fact, on every program, was God Save the King. Now, George V was, of course, the head of state at the time of the Heifetz South African tour. And while respected, the anthem was not universally revered amongst all members of the 
community. Following the debut concert in the Cape Town City Hall, one acerbic columnist wrote as follows. The effect of the entrance of the Governor General and his party, always dramatic, was heightened by the immediate appearance of the great violinist. There would be fewer complaints about the banality of the national anthem if it were always rendered in the manner of the heifetz achron combination. On the right is Heifetz recording the Beethoven with Toscanini eight years later. Now, the Cape Town Orchestra was not the NBC Symphony, nor was conductor William Pickerel exactly Arturo Toscanini. But the performance in the Cape Town City Hall left its mark on the Cape music-loving public. Here is what the Cape Times had to say the following day. I shall count Heifetz's playing of the Beethoven Concerto last night as one of the precious things that have been vouchsafed to me. It is one of the supremely beautiful things, and his rendering of it was flawless in feeling and exquisite in taste. The orchestra seemed to be inspired by his genius. And below, about the audience, the audience was again tremendous. Rarely, if ever, has Cape Town shown so much enthusiasm over a soloist. The Cape Argus reporter and music critic was Professor William Bell, and this is what he had to say the following day about just one of the pieces in the second half of the program. Another lasting memory of last night's concert was the exquisite performance of a transcription of a Chopin nocturne, for description of which I have no superlatives left. Following the fourth concert, Heifetz and Achron left Cape Town for Johannesburg and the tour of the country. How did they travel around? By South African railways, of course. Now, I recall with much nostalgia my train trips to, in South Africa as a child in the 40s and 50s. The, will, the wood panel compartments, the green leather in the photograph and the photographs of the Victoria Falls, the wheel tapping and unnamed sidings in the middle of the night, the coffee laced with coal grit. But Heifetz was somewhat less sanguine. He complained to one reporter of, quote, the bane of travel in South Africa, the dust of road and rail. Here we have Heifetz and Achron arriving at the station in Johannesburg, and they checked into the Carlton Hotel, which from the photograph on the left is the six-story building on the right-hand side of Elof Street. In this photograph, which, which was taken in about 1908. On the right, you can see the elegant palm court at the Carlton, where Heifetz would have enjoyed a cup of tea or coffee. The following day, Heifetz was interviewed by the star. Yasha Heifetz was busy superintending the installation of an upright grand piano in his rooms at the Carlton when I saw him. I found him better looking than even his photos would indicate, with uh, eyes that seemed to be absorbed by things far away but lighted up in merry twinkles as he spoke of his amusing experiences. And beyond all, he radiated a personality quite dissociated from the concert platform and his violin and bow. I should mention that the press in South Africa were particularly struck by the stark contrast between Heifetz's patrician demeanor on the concert platform and his easygoing, genial persona off stage. Here are the advertisements in the Johannesburg Press for, on the left, concerts one and two, and on the right, concert number four. As you can see from the advertisement on the left, only two concerts were initially advertised, just as happened in Cape Town. But then Chernievsky quickly added third, fourth, and even fifth concerts. And it's interesting to see what the promoters were doing to keep pulling in the crowds in the difficult economic times. The ad on the right from the fourth concert, you'll notice that the top ticket price is now seven and sixpence compared to the 10 shillings in the ad on the left. And you'll notice also that they have started to uh, advertise program items as draw cards, in this case, the Beethoven Kreutzer Sonata. Eventually there would be six concerts in Johannesburg. But six concerts in one city during the Great Depression took some doing. The top ticket price for the sixth concert was down to five shillings. 
in the best tradition of using marginal pricing to ensure that the hall would be filled. The draw cross in this case was the Paganini Concerto No. 1. As we saw from the ads, Heifetz played in the Johannesburg City Hall as well as the plaza. While based in Johannesburg, Heifetz also gave two concerts in Pretoria at the Opera House, which is an interesting piece of architecture, but was described by one concert goer as being glacially cold. Now, South Africa, with its predominant Lithuanian Jewish community, offered Heifetz a unique opportunity to reconnect with his roots, as perhaps did no other community in the world. Here is an excerpt of an article which appeared in the South African Zionist Record in June 1932. On the right is a portrait of Heifetz taken by Lithuanian-born South African photographer Leon Levson. This grainy reproduction is the best I could find. I hunted high and low for an original copy, but to no avail. I'd actually like to read what the Zionist record had to say in June 1932. Are we presumptuous when in welcoming in our midst Yasha Heifetz, we greet him as our Heifetz? We know that genius is international, that the great artist belongs to the world, but is, does he not also belong to the people from whose blood he has sprung? However mysterious and elusive may be that something, which makes the artist at once child of his people and citizen of the world, it is real and actual. And Yasha Heifetz is our Heifetz. The Jewish papers were filled with other Heifetz keepsakes during the tour. After a, attending a Heifetz concert in Johannesburg, David Fram, South Africa's Yiddish poet laureate, you might say, was moved to compose a poem in several verses called To Yasha Heifetz, published in Der Afrikaner, the Yiddish language paper of the time. Fram's parents had heard the child Heifetz play in Lithuania. Here is the second verse, kindly translated for me by Cedric Ginsburg. Due to time uh, constraints, I won't read the poem, but it's, it's a fascinating poem to read and is uh, in my book. A few days after this, poem was published on June the 21st, Heifetz and Akron were honored at a luncheon at the Jewish Guild. In the photograph on the right, you can see Jaime Miller, vice president of the Guild, then Akron and Heifetz, and on the right hand side, B.A. Ettlinger, QC, also a vice president of the Guild. In his welcoming address, Ettlinger remarked that, and I quote, the visit to Heifetz by South Africa was an event in musical history which would be long remembered. He assured both Akron and Heifetz that the Jewish community were proud of their great accomplishment. He added that the gramophone had made their names a household word in South Africa, but to be able to attend a concert by Heifetz and Akron provided a thrill quite beyond the power of mechanical reproduction. In reply, Heifetz said that he had long looked forward to his visit to South Africa and that the warm appreciation of the music that he and Mr. Akron had endeavored to express and the enthusiastic reception accorded to them in South Africa were most gratifying. The previous Sunday, Heifetz and Akron had been taken to the Crown Mines Gold Mine to see traditional dancing by groups of contract mine workers. This had become obligatory entertainment for any visitors to Johannesburg. In this picture, you can see the master of ceremonies with an assegai pointed ominously at Heifetz's midriff. And just on the right of Heifetz, you'll see Leo Chernievsky and then Achron. In late 1925, as we noted earlier, the great Russian prima ballerina Anna Pavlova had been brought to South Africa by Chernievsky. On her mind dance visit while in Johannesburg, she was introduced to the head dancer as the greatest dancer in the world. But he begged to differ. No, I am, he said. Commenting on the mind dancing to the Rand Daily Mail, Heifetz was quoted as saying the following. We were simply thrilled. It was to us a wonderful display. 
In their music, one could plainly see the origin of jazz. It does not remind one of the folk music of any other people. The dancers have a wonderful sense of rhythm. At times, I could hardly keep still, for I felt like jumping up and keeping time with them. If you tested their time with a metronome, you would find it was perfect. That sense of rhythm is also manifest in the perfect beat of their steps. What it takes us years to learn, they have naturally. After the fifth concert in Johannesburg, Heifetz and Achron headed to Natal. When he arrived in Durban by train at the end of June, Heifetz learned from a reporter that his wife had given birth to a son in California. So now we know why Florence did not complete the trip. We can also deduce that Heifetz had been busy with things other than playing the violin when the couple were in Japan the previous September. Heifetz played at the City Hall in Durban, the picture of which on the left might lead you to believe that you are in Belfast, Northern Ireland, since architecturally it is a carbon copy of the City Hall in that city. Again, two concerts were scheduled and then a third was added. But as we see from the newspaper ad, the third concert was cancelled due to an injury to Isidore Achron. Lower down is another ad for a lecture by General Smuts on climate and man in Africa. So here we have General Smuts giving a lecture on climate change nearly a hundred years ahead of his time. In place of the cancelled concert, Heifetz was able to relax a bit. Eager to, eager to find out what he was doing when off stage, the media tracked him down one evening to the Balmoral Hotel. I should mention that while in South Africa, Heifetz decided to brush up on his tango dancing skills by taking lessons with a well-known dance teacher by the name of Poppins Salomon. In Durban, he had the opportunity to show off his da tango dancing prowess. And here we see a report in the Natal Press. On Wednesday night at the Balmoral Hotel, Hotel Supper Dance, I had the pleasure of hearing Bobby Jewell and his men playing two tangos. On the floor too was Yasha Heifetz, the eminent violinist, dancing delightfully with Poppins Salomon. His style was quaintly South American, smooth in execution, and the crowd enjoyed watching him. Now, what else did Heifetz do off stage when he wasn't performing? As far as sport was concerned, he was a keen tennis player, as shown here a few years later with his second wife, Frances. But his favorite sport was ping pong. In fact, Heifetz carried ping pong bats with him on all his concert tours, and both in Cape Town and Johannesburg, he pitted his skills against local enthusiasts. There is no record of the game scores. But in later life, Heifetz was reported to be, quote, a good player and a bad loser. One of his many hobbies was philately. His interest in stamp collecting was sparked by none other than Theodore Steinway of Steinway and Sons. On his extensive travels, Heifetz assembled a large collection with a musical theme, which he donated to the, to the Smithsonian Institution in 1978. While in South Africa, he added to his collection. I believe he acquired a Cape Triangular stem, which I did not see when I went to view his collection in Washington, DC. But I did find the Southwest Africa stem of a young Namibian girl blowing a kudu horn. Here we see this stem in Heifetz's album with the notations below in his own hand. But we have digressed. We last left Heifetz in Durban after which he returned to Johannesburg for a sixth concert. So let's get back to his concerts and examine the schedule for his last six performances in South Africa. As you might be able to see, he played in Johannesburg on July the 10th, then went by train to Bloemfontein where he played on July the 12th, then took a train to East London where he played on July the 14th, then he hitched a ride on the Warwick Castle from East London to Port, to Port Elizabeth, where he played on July the 16th. Two days later, he played in Grahamstown on the 18th. 
And then he had to get from Grahamstown to Cape Town for his last concert on the 20th. This schedule had to have been absolutely punishing. Here we see some of the venues where Heifetz performed during his final hectic concert loop. The Grand Theatre in Bloemfontein on the left and the Feather Market Hall in Port Elizabeth on the right. On the left here, we see uh, the British colonial urban architecture of the East London City Hall juxtaposed on the right with a period painting by Sidney Carter of the Nahoon River, just a stone's throw away from the city hall. Typical of the plaudits heaped on Heifetz during the tour, the music correspondent of the East London Dispatch opened his critique with the following statement. Last night, an exceptionally large audience in the city hall was enraptured with such violent playing as has never before been seen and heard in this town. And so we come to the final concert in Cape Town. Based on the reviews of this concert, there was no evidence that Heifetz is playing with anything but the precision and perfection that had come to be expected. However, when he made his usual modest entrance onto the stage to thunderous applause, he was said to have looked extremely tired and pale. No surprise there. Following the concert, a correspondent of the Cape Argus reported as follows. After the echo of the last beautiful notes of his violin had died away and the audience had reluctantly left the hall, the green room was crowded with friends and admirers who were clamoring to congratulate Heifetz on another triumph and autograph hunters were eagerly awaiting at the door. I am very, very tired, Heifetz said to the reporter and mean to have a complete rest on the boat and for another month when I get back to America before starting on a tour of the States. He was then whisked off to a party given in his honor at the Cape Town home of Mr. and Mrs. Sidney Benjamin. No wonder Heifetz was fatigued. On July the 22nd, Heifetz and Achron boarded the Warwick Castle for the return voyage to Southampton. On the return voyage, Heifert spent most of his time in his stateroom, apparently working on a new concerto by Italian composer Castelnuovo Tedesco. But he did participate in some onboard entertainment as witnessed by this race card for the afternoon horse races on board ship. In the theatrical trappings of this race, as you may be able to see from the check mark on the program, Heifetz played the part of the veterinary surgeon. In his statement, Heifetz could not have conceived of what would happen to the Warwick Castle a decade later. In World War II, she was requisitioned by the British Admiralty for use as a troop transport ship. So just 10 years after Heifetz sailed in her, she participated in the North African landings. Having disembarked her troops on November the 10th, 1942, she joined the convoy for the return voyage home. On November the 14th at 08.50 hours, when north of Gibraltar, off the Portuguese coast, she was torpedoed by U-boat number 413 and sank in 85 minutes. The U-boat had waited under the convoy and targeted the rearmost troop ship. And so we draw the curtain on the Heifetz South African tour. I'd like to end this presentation on September the 17th, 1964, the day I was able to fully appreciate what it meant when Nathan Milstein said to Itzhak Perlman, forget the recordings. This was the day I had the thrill of seeing Heifetz give a concert live for the first time in my life. The venue, as you see, was Carnegie Hall, 47 years after Heifetz's original triumph there in 1917, and 32 years after he gave his last concert in South Africa in the Cape Town City Hall. On this occasion, I did not have the benefit of a front row seat, but underturned by the stern warning in the program, snapped this clandestine historic photograph for posterity of Yasha Heifetz and Gregor Piadegorsky in performance. Thank you.